Um, it says, There came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in uh, Ophrah, that pertained to Joash the Abizrite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. Patriarchs and Prophets tells us that Gideon was the last son of Joash that was left. All the rest of them had been slain in battles with the Midianites. Gideon was the only boy that Joash had left. Gideon, of course, it says he was threshing wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. Well, the Midianites would come into Israel and uh, would make sure that all their produce was taken. They were ravishing the Israelites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? Where be all his miracles which our father told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. The Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites, have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. You know, Gideon, of course, receives the call to go and deliver his people from the Midianites who were wreaking just utter destruction in Israel for a good 20 years. I mean, imagine if that was going on in America, and I think we're going to be seeing some things like that uh, down the road. When Gideon received the call, what was his response? It was very similar to many people in the Bible, and there seems to be a continuous theme that's repeated again and again and again. And that is, Gideon, when he was told to go do this work for the Lord, Gideon's response was, number one, I'm from a tribe that is not significant in Israel at all. Uh, Manasseh was nobody in Israel. Judah was a big shot. Uh, Ephraim was a big shot. But Manasseh? Manasseh was a nobody. Manasseh was... Of course, he was uh, the oldest son of Joseph, but Ephraim was preferred, and Ephraim's tribe was much more powerful than Manasseh. Manasseh's was obscure. And Gideon says, I'm not only from a feeble, pathetic tribe like Manasseh, but I'm the least in my father's house. So Gideon was all involved in saying, Lord, why have you come to ask me? Who am I? Who am I? Kind of like the way Moses responded um, and other people in the Bible. So that, that folk becomes key and it occurs again and again and again in Scripture a key element for God to use somebody is that they realize by themselves they're pathetic. You know, and it, it's just the way it is. And that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. What did Jesus say? He said, blessed are the what in spirit? The poor. Wasn't talking about how many bills in a person's wallet, was he? He was talking about somebody who recognized need. Recognized that they needed God's help. That there were things in their life that they couldn't handle apart from the power of Christ. So recognizing need is critical before God can use somebody. 
Um, David in Psalms 40 said, For I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. So David recognized need. And there's nothing that God can't do for somebody that recognizes need. That's exciting. That's exciting. What did Peter say? He said, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and what would happen? He will lift you up. That's that song, you know, that, that young people sing and old people should sing it too. Let's see, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And He will lift you up. Higher and higher and He will lift you up. See, that if we just get that thought, folk, that if we recognize our need, there's nothing God can't do for us. Absolutely, Nellie. They don't need. They don't have need for the Lord. So, you know, whatever it is, whatever might be coming across our path today that, that where we have need because there's something too big for us, praise God for that. Because then he can work. And he will work. Patriarchs and Prophets 553 and 554 says, But God saw in him a man of courage and integrity. He was distrustful. There it is, folk. He was distrustful of himself and willing to follow the guidance of the Lord. God does not always choose for His work men of the greatest talents, but He selects those whom He can best use before honor is humility. Proverbs 15.33 The Lord can work most effectually through those who are most sensible of their own insufficiency and who will rely upon Him as their leader and source of strength. He will make them strong by uniting their weakness to His might. Wise by connecting their ignorance with His wisdom. If they would cherish true humility, the Lord could do much more for His people. But there are few who can be trusted with any large measure of responsibility or success without becoming self-confident and forgetful of their dependence upon God. This is why in choosing the instruments for his work, the Lord passes by those whom the world honors as great, talented, and brilliant. They are often too proud and self-sufficient. And as Nellie, as you just said, they feel competent to act without counsel from God. They're too wise. They're too, you know, they're too strong. Um, they don't need help. And so God can't use them. Nobody becomes somebody. Galatians 6.3 says, If a man thinks himself to be something, when he's nothing, he's deceived. If we think we're somebody, well, we've got to be cut down about four or five notches before God says, now you recognize what you really are? Now I can use you. But as long as we think we're somebody, when we're not, we're deceiving ourselves. That's what Galatians 6.3 says. 2 Corinthians 3.5 says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. You know, you look at all the, the men and women in Scripture. It was those who recognized they were not sufficient. Those who recognized they were nothing. Then it is that God can make us somebody. Make us a flower in the midst of nothingness. Well... Gideon wasn't going to go out and fight. 
I mean, how many people were in the Midianite army? There was a hundred thousand plus. The odds against Gideon were huge. How many of us would go out with 10,000 or 30,000? I guess he started with 32,000 men. The Midianites were around 120 to 150,000. Folk, that's a good one to five ratio. So Gideon needed help. He needed signs. He needed the constant reassurance that God was with him. Does that sound familiar? You know, God blesses us so much and, and has guided us for so long, but we're constantly praying and saying, Lord, but I, I need to see another sign. You know, we do the same thing. We do the same thing. We're probably ten times worse than he was. But Judges 6, 34 to 40, it says, But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and a beezer was gathered after him, and he sent messengers through all Manasseh, who also was gathered after him. He sent messengers to Asher, to Zebulun, to Naphtali, and they came up to meet them. And Gideon said to the Lord, he said, But if, if you're going to save Israel by my hand, as you've said, I'm going to put a fleece of wool in the floor. If the dew is on the fleece only and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then I'll know that you're going to save Israel by my hand, as you said. So what God said wasn't enough. There had to be more. I need more than just what you said. That's not enough. And it was so, for he rose up early on the morrow, thrust the fleece together, wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water, Gideon said, Let not your anger be hot against me. I'll speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee. But this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. Well, Gideon needed reassurance. He needed that courage to go forward to meet an enemy that was huge as the Midianites were. You know, I often wonder to myself, what, what, would, what signs would we need if we ended up in a prison cell somewhere? Or we ended up in some, some place in a dungeon? What would we think? How would we respond? Would we say, Oh God, I, I'm, I must be forsaken of you? Would, would we say that? What would we do? Facing enemies that are, are so big. That's what Gideon was facing. But God's amazing grace was patient unbelievably patient with Gideon as he is unbelievably patient with us. After confirming to Gideon his presence and companionship in this terrible undertaking, Gideon wanted more assurances. God's amazing grace did not become impatient. But God's amazing grace gave Gideon all the signs he needed and more. I'm with you, Gideon. I haven't left. I'll do exactly what you say. I'll give you every sign you need to let you know that you're in my will. And then the challenge came when Gideon and his men, they had 32,000. They come out, it's Judges chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. The Bible says, Zerubbabel, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him, rose up early, pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, even though you're... One to five ratio, one of your men to five of the enemy... 
The people that are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Therefore go and proclaim in the ears of the people, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. How do you think Gideon felt about that? You know, that, that's like a church of you know, 30 people and God wants to do something with this little church and He says, you know, there's too many people in the church. And so you have people leaving. You know, and it, it gets down smaller and smaller and you go, what? Too many? <laughs> So 22,000 people left and there remained 10,000. Now, folk, it's a ratio of about, uh, what would we say, 1 to 20? 1 to 20. The Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Oh, come on, are you kidding? That can't be. It can't be. Bring them down to the water. I will try them there for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say to thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say to thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. Why? Why did God continue to dwindle down the army? Why? Absolutely, Dennis. Absolutely. In the Lord's work, all of these people, when, they, when God had given them the victory, they would have said, we did it! Isn't that the way we are? Look, look at the great thing we've done. Are you kidding me? <laughs> A little group of people is going all over the world with the three angels' messages? Are you kidding me? That is the hand of God. You know, I was thinking about it yesterday. The folks in Germany have translated this, this brochure on Islam, ISIS, and Ishmael. They are in the process of translating it into multiple languages. Russian, uh, they've already got it in German. They're going to translate into Arabic. And they're going to go this summer, they said, to former Soviet Union countries to uh, spread those flyers everywhere in those Soviet satellite countries. Like... Um, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, all these stands. And I was thinking about it, I thought, you know, right now, the work that we're doing in Alaska, do you realize how close Alaska and the Soviet Union are? They're right next door, they're buds. It's just like uh, Key West and Cuba. That's the same way with Alaska and Russia. And I thought, I mean, it's not like we've, we've reached every single person, but folk, the work that God has enabled us to do, it's going around the world. And I thought, Lord, look what you've done. It's amazing. It's amazing. But... Looky here, if there's too many people and they have a spirit that says, look at what I've done. That's how it is, folks. So God said, can't use them. Can't use those people. They've got to go home. So it goes from 32,000 to 10,000. Then it goes from 10,000 down to 300. Everyone 
that goes down to the water, that laps up the water with his tongue as a dog laps, him shalt thou set by himself. Everyone that bows down upon his knees to drink, the number of them that lap, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300 men. All the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. What did that show? Well, if you get down on your knees and you're lapping up water, you're not concerned about the enemies all around you. You're concerned about yourself. But there were 300 men that got water but had their eyes around making sure that there were no enemies approaching. There were 300 of them. And the Lord said, Gideon, those are the people. By the 300 men that, la that lapped will I save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand and let all the other people go every man to his place. Folk, I, I pray, I pray that we get that one idea in our heads today is that in the battles that rage and are raging in our world, the battle is over. Who is going to be king? Who is going to get the praise that he truly deserves? Will the Lord get that praise, or will we take it to ourselves? That's the great issue. And that's the issue. It was in Gideon's day, and that's what the issue is today. Will we let God have the praise that He deserves? If we do, folks, there is nothing we can't do with God's power. Nothing. Nothing. The Midianites, around 150,000 men, 32,000 to face them was too much. Instead of the odds being 1 to 5, now it would be 1 to 500. The point being that with the Lord on our side, it doesn't matter how many enemies there are. You say, well, I can't do that because if I do that, I'm going to have all these people against me. Well, is the question we have to ask ourselves is, is the Lord... On our side. If the Lord's on our side, it doesn't matter how many are on the other side. Is the Lord on our side? Are we following what the Lord wants us to do? If we are, there could be 10 million on the other side. In Psalms 3, David says... I will not be afraid if there are 10,000 people gathered against me. Doesn't matter. Is God on our side? God wanted the people to trust Him. He wanted them to realize that the greatness of their feet came because of Him and not them. The Lord and His amazing grace continues to try and teach us that today. You know, it's like the story of Job. When the Lord finally spoke to Job, the first question He asked Job was, He says, Job, where were you when I made the world? Where were you when I, when I set the... the yeah, hanging the stars in space. Where were you, Job? Where were you? And folk, that's a good place to be. It's to say, Lord, I was nobody. I was nothing when you did that. So where were we when God made this waterfall? Where were we? We were nothing. We were dust. Got to keep that in mind. And then God's amazing grace gave Gideon one more sign. Because how do you think Gideon was feeling at this point? 300 against 
120,000 to 150,000 plus. What do you, how do you think Gideon's feeling at that moment? He's scared. He's petrified. What are we going to do? This is impossible odds. Well, God's amazing grace understood Gideon's mind and heart. Judges 7, 9 to 14, it says, It came to pass, the Lord said to him, Go, get thee down to the host, to Midian, for I have delivered it into your hand. But if you fear to go down, go thou with Purah, thy servant, down to the host. Thou shalt hear what they say. Afterwards shall your hands be strengthened to go down to the host. Then Gideon went down with Purah, his servant, to the outside of the armed men that were in the host. The Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. Their camels were without number as the sand of the sea sighed for multitude. When Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream to his fellow and said, I've dreamed a dream. A cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian, came into a tent, smote it that it fell, overturned it that the tent lay long. His fellow answered, and Gideon and his servant are listening to this right outside the tent. And the guy says, this is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for into his hand has God delivered Midian and all the host. As I'm reading that to you, my, my spine is beginning to tingle. I've <laughs> Can you imagine what that did to Gideon? Yes, we've got a chance now. We can do it, guys. God's going to do this great work for us tonight. There's that loaf of barley bread. This was the crowning sign to Gideon that the Lord would work mightily on his behalf as he had done so many times before for his children. And what is that oft-repeated statement that we often quote? We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we forget the way the Lord has led us in the past and his teachings in our past history. Nothing to fear. You say, oh, but, but look at all that's going on. Yeah, but we don't have to fear that. We don't have to fear anything. Except if we forget the mighty things that God has done in the past. Patriarchs and Prophets says, By divine direction, a plan of attack was suggested to him, which he immediately set out to execute. And what was that plan of attack? Let's see. We're going to roll in some atomic missiles. We're going to blow the Midianites into eternity. Oh, uh, well, maybe they didn't have those. Okay, well, let's get a few tanks then, and we'll just bomb them into oblivion. Well, how about those landmines that you've already set up in the valley and, and as soon as they step on them, they'll just blow... No, that's not going to work either, folks. Another point we better... Let's get it deep into our heads. God's methods of, of doing things are so different than the way the world does things. So different. Gideon and his men were to get pitchers with a torch inside. And they were to get a trumpet. Now how do you fight with trumpets and a torch? How do you fight with that? You don't. And that was the whole point. It was the whole point. Every man was given a trumpet and a torch concealed in an earthen pitcher. 
The men were stationed in such a manner as to approach the Midianite camp from different directions. Well, folks, with 300 men and the Midianites are 120,000 plus strong down in the valley, how many different directions can 300 men come from? There's not a whole lot that 300... I mean, how far and how thin do you spread 300 men around a valley of over 120,000 men? Can't get much. So Gideon spread them thin all as far around as he could so that when those trumpets started blowing and those torches started racing towards them, the Midianites would think that they were being attacked on all sides. Boy, that's playing mind games. That was playing with their head. Judges 7 says, he divided the 300 men into three companies. He put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps. He said to them, look on me and do likewise. When I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, you do. When I blow a trumpet, I and all that are with me, you blow the trumpets on every side of all the camp and say, the sword, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came to the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. They had but newly set the watch. They blew the trumpets, broke the pitchers that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets, break the pitchers, held the lamps in their left hands, the trumpets in their right hands to blow with all, and they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. They stood every man in his place round about the camp and all the host ran and cried and fled. You talk about terrorism. The Midianites were terrorized. Terrorized by a trumpet and a torch. Do you know why, as Paul was sharing this morning, why the powers that be today in our world, why they want to know everything possible about us. Sheila, as you mentioned in your employment um, attempts, they want to know what your religion is. They want to know, you know your background. They want to know your, your uh, culture. Why do they want to know all that? You know why? Because the devil the devil is being terrorized by a group of people in this world that refuse to submit to him. He is terrorized by them. And all of the devil's followers are terrorized by them too. That's why God's true people today are being considered as terrorists. Think about it, folks. Think about it. Gideon and his men terrorized the Midianite hosts. Terrorized them. The simple act of blowing a blast on the trumpet by the army of Joshua around Jericho and by Gideon's little band about the hosts of Midian was made effectual through the power of God to overthrow the might of his enemies. The most complete system that men have ever devised apart from the power and wisdom of God will prove a failure while the most unpromising methods will succeed when divinely appointed and entered upon with humility and faith. Trust in God and obedience to His will is our essential to the Christian the spiritual warfare is to Gideon and Joshua in their battles with the Canaanites. By the repeated manifestations of His power in behalf of Israel, God would lead them to have faith in Him with confidence to seek His help in every emergency. He's just as willing to work with the efforts of His people now to accomplish great things through weak instruments. 
All heaven awaits our demand upon its wisdom and strength. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Isn't that amazing? The most complete system that men have ever devised. Sound like the New World Order to you? Sound like Babylon the Great in Revelation 17 and 18 with the kings of the earth and the merchants of the earth and the churches of the earth? All in union, conspiratorial union with the Vatican? Does that sound like the most complete system that men have ever devised? In modern times it sure is. Apart from the power and wisdom of God, we'll, we'll do what? will prove a failure. Folk, think about, think about Babylon the Great with all the machinery, all the technology, all the weaponry, all the money enlisted on behalf of evil in this world. But Revelation 18 says that Babylon the Great is coming down. It's going to be destroyed. And what about God's professed people? Revelation 17, 14 says that the Lamb, they will make war with the Lamb and the Lamb shall overcome them and that His children will too and they shall be called faithful and chosen. Well, folk, there you have the story of Gideon in Revelation 17 and 18. God's little, helpless, humble, teachable people will go right on through to the sea of glass and the most complete system that the devil could devise in our world today, the papal system, is going to be destroyed. It's going to happen again, folks. Guarantee it. God provided victory through Gideon. Thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Torches and trumpets, strange battle devices. The Bible says that God's word is a torch. It's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We hold on, we spend time, we pray, we read our Bibles, we memorize scripture. Folk, that torch will serve to guide us to the pearly gates. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord today. And Isaiah 58, 1 says that we are to lift up our voice like a what? Like a trumpet. So if we will stick to the word of God and we will share the truths of the Bible with other people, well, we're walking in Gideon's shoes. We've got our torch in hand. We've got our trumpet blowing. That's what God wants us to do today, folk. That's what He's called us to do. In closing, Great Controversy, page 602, the Bible says, when the testing time shall come, those who have made God's word there's our torch. Their rule of life will be revealed. In summer, there's no noticeable difference between evergreens and other trees. But when the blasts of winter come, the evergreens remain unchanged while other trees are stripped of their foliage. The false-hearted professor may not now be distinguished from the real Christian, but the time is just upon us when the difference will be apparent. Let opposition arise. Let bigotry and intolerance bear sway. Let persecution be kindled. The half-hearted and hypocritical will waver and yield the faith. But the true Christian 
will stand firm as a rock, his faith stronger, his hope brighter than in days of prosperity. Thy testimonies are my meditation. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. Folk, my prayer for each one of us today is that we're spending time with the torch every day. And we're letting God's Word, not men's words, not government's words, not leaders' words, but God's Word. What does God say? And follow by His grace, follow that path. Because, folk, as we continue to read our Bibles and with His help to put into practice what He says, the power of that word will become stronger and stronger in our lives. That's my prayer for each one of us today.